So this is the setup of a uh, uh, Michelson interferometer, and it's uh, quite unlike other interference setups that you have seen before, because the other interference setups usually involve the things that are coming from more or less, or things that are occupying more or less the same physical space. Uh, when you had a double slit, the double slits are very close together. When we did the uh, thin film interference, the path length difference you saw wasn't really that much. This, in this Michelson interferometer setup, the two beams that are interfering with each other, they, um, at some point in their journey, are separated by a large physical distance. And um, so, you know, so this is a different setup. The, the basic consideration still remains the same in that you are looking at the phase difference between the two and you can just set some rel uh, particular reference phase, call that zero, and you look for phase change from that. That's uh, the basic setup in any kind of interference analysis and that doesn't change for the Michelson interferometer, but the arrangement here is uh, quite unusual compared to um, what you have seen so far. And I, by the way, I want you to ignore this uh, compensator plate. Uh, so we are going to assume that for our analysis, we have a super coherent laser that has a coherence length of infinity. Um, uh, co yeah, normally that's not the case, but we'll just assume that for now. Um, so in this uh, Michelson interferometer, what's done is you have a beam coming in, it's split into two parts. One that's uh, reflected this way and travels this path, comes back, and then comes back here. And there's a beam that has gone, uh, so this is a 50-50 mirror. So there's a beam that has passed through, and then it reflects off of this mirror, and then comes back, reflects here, and comes here. So you see that um, um, if I trace it out, the two beams, they share a common path um, at the very beginning and at the very end. So the parts that are different are the ones in the arms. So, um, so at the very beginning, um, here they share a common path, here they share a common path. So common path. So what you're looking at is the phase difference that takes place as these two beams are traveling in, wow, that blue path is way. <laughs> Anyways, um, the phase difference that's taking place as the two beams are traveling these distances. And this is where it's important to think more in terms of reference phase because um, you know, these are macroscopic distances um, you are never going to be set them in such a way that there's actually zero phase difference between them. Um, so your starting place is you have them set up in a way that there's an integral multiple of two pi phase difference. And, and then you do something to one of these two arms that will cause that um, phase difference to change from that reference phase by a cycle or more. That's what you would observe and um, that tells you something about something that you want you to measure. Uh, now, we are not going to do much with this uh, interferometer setup, especially for your exam one. But the reason I'm bringing up um, this now is more or less for a historical reason. This uh, interferometer setup plays an important role in the, well, let me, um, plays an important role in the acceptance of a special relativity that we are going to talk about in the next week. Um, I want you to be careful because I didn't want to say development because I, well, I'll talk about this next week. <laughs> so, um, so I want you to be aware of this interferometer setup because it's important to history of physics. But as far as your exam is concerned, I probably won't give you any exam questions that pertain to this. So what I want to do now is um, you can actually, um, if you have the correct uh, lab apparatus, which we don't, um, you can actually use this to measure uh, index of refraction of air. Do people remember index of refraction of air? Very close, to Very close to one, but it's not exactly one, right? So how close to one? There's uh, some number of zeros. I want to say it's uh, three zeros and then one. 
you know, I'm not actually sure. Let's look it up. Uh, index of refraction of air. So it's very close to one. What I'm not sure is how many zeros. Because three zeros, and then, OK, not one, but three. All right, so that's the in index of refraction of air. Um, you guys remember the, the reflection and refraction lab, right? Yes? Um, using the method, methods you use it in the lab, can you imagine measuring this index of refraction of anything with, I guess, um, three parts in 10,000? No, none of the methods that you use there is that precise. Interferences. You can use uh, Michelson interferometer setup to measure index of refraction of air. Uh, we do setups that are like in an instructional lab. I'm not talking about setup that's you know available at national labs. I'm, the, so the thing that we don't have is I don't have any. Uh, well, so this is the setup for measuring index of refraction of air. So this is the schematic diagram of the setup. And what I'm telling you that I don't have is I don't have this. I don't have. I have to have this built somewhere to be able to do this lab. But that's really the only thing I don't have. Um, if we had a chamber that we can vacuum out, um, then we could actually measure the index of refraction ourselves. So what I want to do um, in about hopefully no more than 10, 15 minutes today in class is just to um, do a quick calculation that would uh, at least give you some sense of what we would need to measure to be able to actually measure uh, index of refraction of something with this much precision. Okay. So, so let's use this setup here. Um, so so the, ev this diagram makes sense to everyone, what it's representing? Yes? Good. OK. So um, because we don't have an actual physical setup that I can show you, what you have to imagine that you are seeing here or you know, don't put your eye in the path of the laser beam. Um, what you imagine uh, placing a screen here and observing from over here is you are going to imagine seeing this, seeing this pattern of interference. So in the very middle of the circle is where you, um, where the, the two beams are destructively interfering. So somehow the path length difference works out so that you have a half a cycle difference plus however many integers. And as you move out by geometry, by some uh, difference in angles, as you move out a little bit, constructive interference, back to destructive, back to constructive, destructive, and so on. And what you would see is as you change one of those two arms that you saw, as you change the, let's say, amount of air in this arm, you are going to see this uh, interference pattern shift. So it'll look like these circles kind of uh, uh, moving outward. So there will be a bright spot that happens in the middle. So um, bright spot that happens in the middle, and then um, as you pump out more air, then the bright spot will turn into dark spot again. So that's uh, what you are noticing as one full cycle of that indicates that the, the phase of the, um, of the light beam that's gone through that other arm changed by one full cycle. Everyone has that incorrect image in your head? You, like if you were doing this lab, you wouldn't know what to look for? Kind of? OK, yeah. OK. So that's uh, what I want you to imagine. So uh, what I want to do is I just want to work out some numbers. Um, how should I do it? Let's uh, use the numbers that are given here. So, um, so it gives the size of the chamber that could be vacuumed out. Um, and um, so let, let's go through a series of questions. Uh, so does the wavelength of light matter here? Like when, so what we are going to do calculation of is we are going to look for, as we are observing here, uh, what we are going to look for is uh, number of cycles of uh, fringes shifted. That's what we are going to look for in this screen here. And we have a number fixed here, length of the glass chamber, you know, or path length here, or you know, physical length there. Um, 
so I just want to specify any other numbers that we need to specify. Um, the wavelength of laser, is that an uh, important part? Is that a parameter that matters numerically? Yes, no? I hear see a lot of no's and I don't see any yes. Anybody say yes? Why does it matter, Crystal? Your intuition says yes. It's a good intuition. So if you want to be more specific, this is what it is. In the end, what we care about is phase. Phase is what we care about in the end. We don't care about physical distance. Um, we only care about phase. And you could have specified as cycles or specified as radians. So what matters here is, well, so you are given this physical length. And um, I guess, what you are, yeah, so you are given this physical length and you need some, um, you need some parameter to turn this physical length into something that can be compared to a phase. So what would you need to do that? Wavelength, wavelength right? Because you have some distance and wavelength tells you uh, how much distance is in one cycle. So if you want have some distance, you want to turn it into some number of cycles, you need a wavelength. So here, um, maybe it, it's possible that it could cancel out, but let me just assume that wavelength is going to matter because I know that I need a wavelength to turn this into number of cycles. So wavelength, let's say it's a helium neon laser, 633 nanometers. So that's a reasonable number. Um, let's go through some other parameters that I think won't matter. This distance here, will it matter? No, because it's common to both beams, right? No phase change here. What about this distance? Doesn't matter for the same reason. Now, what about this distance? Does that matter? Now, if you're looking for absolute phase difference, then sure, yes, it matters. This is why it's important that you know what you're looking for. So you are not, um, this is the distinction I want you to draw. You are not trying to predict, is the center going to be dark or bright? You are not trying to do that. You take this as it comes out. Maybe the center will come out to be dark. Maybe it will come out to be bright. And after you have that set up, all you are going to look for is the change of one cycle or change in the number of cycles from dark to bright back to dark. So if you're trying to predict is the center going to be dark or bright, then yes, in that case, oops, uh, in that case, yes, this length would matter. But since you're just going to take whatever pattern that appears here as given, whatever this length is, actually doesn't matter for us. Good, that argument is, argument is convincing to everyone. And can you say that the same for here? Whatever actual length is here, it doesn't actually matter. Right? OK. So the only thing that matters is the change that's going on here. So when you initially place this glass chamber, you'll get some kind of interference pattern here. And you are changing just the one thing. You are changing the index of refraction in this chamber it's going to go from initial index of refraction of this value, 1.0003, to it's going to go to some final value of 1 if we vacuum it out completely. Okay. So that's going to lead to some amount of phase difference from the reference phase we had. And that's going to turn into the number of cycles or fringe that you will see. So let's just take a quick estimate in the number of the cycles of fringe shifted and see if that's something that you know, one could expect to reasonably measure. Good. All right, so let me start out with a uh, phase shift, just change in phase. Um, um, change in phase from uh, glass chamber being vacuumed. Oops, one there. 
Um, I'm being a little bit specific here. I'm not looking for phase difference between the two arms. Whatever the number is, I don't think I'm going to be able to predict it. I'm, going, I'm looking for phase change, not difference. Okay? So, um, so I want to look at it this way. I want to count the number of cycles I had here initially. So uh, let me call this um, number. So I'm actually just uh, coming up with formula on the spot based on my physical intuition. There's no pre-made formula that I can look up. I'm just uh, thinking, all right, I have that um, physical distance. I want, um, uh, oh, so uh, let, me, let me write down uh, the general outline of this formula. So for this phase difference, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be 2 pi times um, initial number of cycles minus the, sorry, final number of cycles minus the initial number of cycles. So final number of cycles minus initial number of cycles within that glass chamber. Like, does this expression make sense? Like, you know, the first time you see it, you might not guess it, but once it's been spelled out, I'm asking, you know, does this make sense? That's what we are looking for. Okay, good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out an expression for final number of cycles based on the parameters we decided. Same thing for the initial number of cycles. Get a difference, get an expression that way. This is the kind of thing you would do when you are you know, working in a lab. A, a lot of the things you do, um, on, you don't have a pre-made formula given to you, but many things are things that you can figure out as you go because it's, uh, um, once you know the underlying theory, it's intuitive. It just depends on some simple arrangement of things. So it, final number of cycles, that would be, um, so I want to propose this as the general formula for number of cycles. See if it makes sense. Number of cycles within a given length is equal to given length divided by the wavelength in the medium. So wavelength in vacuum divided by n. That's the number of cycles in a physical path distance of D. Right? That's what we've been using for thin film and other stuff, right? It doesn't change it here, so. All right. So I'm just going to use this. So between these two, um, D hopefully won't change. It's the same glass chamber. Hopefully it's not contracting or expanding in size. So the only thing that will change is N. The wavelength in vacuum, that's just property of the light, so that won't change. So. This phase difference is 2 pi times final number of cycles. Um, let me simplify this a little bit. This is n times d over lambda vacuum. So it's the final index of refraction, which is 1. Um, so d over wavelength in vacuum minus the initial number of cycles. Mm, I should have had them flipped. Doesn't matter. I'm going to get a negative answer, but I'm only looking for absolute value anyway. So it's going to be, uh, so this in N initial is the index of refraction of air. So index of refraction of air times the distance over uh, the lambda vacuum. So, so this is the expression. And once you get that, you can simplify this a little bit more. Um, so let me do that. It's uh, 2 pi times um, d over wavelength in vacuum. And um, it's 1 minus n air. Let me write it out differently. So minus the index of refraction of air minus 1. Good. So this is actually one of the source of the high precision in interference measurement. When you do interference, you are essentially making a difference measurement. If we were imagining measuring this as um, from zero, 
then what you need is a precision of three parts in 10,000. But instead of that, imagine you are measuring n minus 1. Then you are still measuring a small number. You are still measuring 0 0.0003. But you don't need a high precision on that measurement itself. If you had, I don't know, 10% error on that, then instead of measuring 0 0.0003, you measure 0 0.00033. So um, for those of you who go into fundamental physics research, this is in the area called uh, precision measurements. And a lot of precision measurements are based on interference for this reason, because in an interference measurement, you are taking a difference between two very large numbers. And that difference can be taken very precisely. Anyways, let me finish the calculation here. So I'll just plug in the numbers. So that will give me the... Um, mm, that will give me the phase. Actually, let me plug in this number. Instead of plugging the numbers right now, if I take this and divide out the 1 over 2 pi, this is, go this is going to be the number of cycles that I should be looking for anyway. Right? So I'm going to ignore this 2 pi. Um, calculate um, d over the wavelength. And um, that times 0 0.0003 will give how many fringes I should expect to see. Okay. So let me plug in those numbers. So d is 2 centimeters, um, or 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Lambda is 633 nanometers, or I'm just going to use approximate numbers, about 600 times 10 to minus 9 meters. And the index of refraction of air minus 1 is going to be this, or 3 times 10 to minus 4. These are numbers I can do by hand. So 10 to, mm, let me do this in different color. So it's uh, 10 to minus 6 divided by, uh, this is actually 6 times 10 to minus 7. So 2 divided by 6, um, so 1 third, oh, times 3, so 1. <laughs> um, so working it all out, this should be, uh, so 2 divided by 6 times 3 is 1 times 10 to minus 6 divided by 10 to minus 7 is People here can do powers of 10 calculation in their head? 10, right? Yeah, 10. So the number of cycles you will see is 10. Do you think you can count to 10? Right? And if you're counting 10 cycles, your precision will be at least 10% on the number of cycles you're counting. Right? What that means is your precision on the difference will be 10%, which actually translates to something like 0.0. 1% error on the final answer, or 0.01, yeah, something like 0.01, 0.03% error. So this is the kind of measurement that you could actually do in an undergraduate lab with a very modest instrument. And uh, what we'll describe later on, um, I guess next week, is the kind of experiment that Michelson, whom the interferometer is named after, Michelson and Morley did. They were trying to measure the variation in speed of light. And this is one of the most famous null result experiment where they measured the zero. They didn't get anything. They, they were looking for variation of speed of light. They measured the zero variation of speed of light. And because, but, but even though it was null result, because their setup was so precise, they could uh, set very high constraint on how much the speed of light could vary. And this was an important factor in people accepting what we today call Einstein's special theory of relativity. So we'll talk about that more next week. I just wanted to introduce this today so that we don't have to take up this time next week. <laughs>